friends. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit more about interspecific interactions. In our last lesson together, I talked a little bit about mutualisms, but today I'm going to talk more about parasites and predators. And two of the main takeaways from this lesson is are that um, both of these uh, organisms uh, play an important role in population dynamics and in community structure. Um, and both parasites and predators have pro profound effects when introduced to a host population that doesn't previously have defenses. Okay, so new parasites, new predators, they can have the biggest impact of all. And so let's start by talking about parasites. Uh, parasitism is one of the two interspecific interactions in which one of the species has a positive um, effect, right? So they gain from this interspecific interaction, um, but the other species, of course, is hurt by this interspecific interaction. And so parasites ultimately benefit from their host. Um, they increase their fitness by using the host in a close prolonged association for food, habitat, or dispersal. Uh, and just a couple of terms associated with this uh, for clarification, um, a heavy load of parasites is considered to be an infection, whereas the outcome of the infection that is considered to be the disease. Now, parasites can be classified um, in a couple different ways. Um, first, they can be classified by size. Essentially, are they big or they little? Uh, microparasites are organisms such as bacteria, protists, um, also viruses. Um, and so many diseases are actually caused by these micro or super tiny parasites. Uh, relative to the host, these parasites have a fairly short generation time. And so generally they are reproducing over and over again within a single host, as opposed to macroparasites. Um, these are generally visible by the, with the naked eye. Um, and they have a slightly longer lifespan. Um, in fact, many of them, uh, uh, utilize multiple hosts over the course of their entire life cycle. Okay, so uh, this is an intestine infected by such a macroparasite. Okay, so a parasite can be classified by size. It can also be classified by um, whether or not it can live without the host. Um, and so I'm going to give you some plant examples because maybe we don't think about plants as often. And so I um, just want to use plant examples, but keep in mind that um, these terms can be used for um, a lot of different types of parasites. Okay, so um, hemiparasites are facultative. That is, they can live without the host, but they definitely benefit from this prolonged interaction with the host. And so again, we're thinking of plants as parasites. Uh, so in these hemiparasites, um, these plants are still photosynthetic. Okay, so they can actually live on their own, uh, photosynthesize, um, independently from the host. However, when they do have an interaction with the host plant, um, so parasite, plant, host, plant, two different organisms, um, ultimately the parasite uh, sucks nutrients and water from the host's xylem, okay, xylem and flow. Uh, so uh, one example here is American mistletoe. Uh, so here is uh, the host plant, woody plant, and uh, this ball here is actually uh, the parasite. So American mistletoe, um, this plant actually is spread by seeds, and ultimately the seed lands on a branch, and uh, the plant, the mistletoe grows into the xylem of the branches of the host. Um, and um, again, it's going to suck water and nutrients from the host plant, but it does actually photosynthesize a bit on its own. So it isn't completely dependent upon the host plant. Um, in fact, when multiple mistletoe are on the same host, which happens all the time, um, in fact, uh, whenever I've seen these, it's never just one, it's, you know, and a mistletoe is covering many different branches. Um, when there are multiple mistletoes on a host plant, sometimes photosynthesis can even be increased. Okay, so uh, this hemiparasite is still taking water and nutrients from the host, so it's still sucking out what it needs, but, um, you know, sometimes it can increase the entire photosynthetic potential of the plant host um, interaction. Um, 
So uh, you've probably heard of mistletoe, um, you know, in terms of like this, this holiday plant, you're supposed to kiss under it. So like, what the heck are we <laughs> um, kind of uh, focusing on a parasite for? Why does it have this kind of lovey-dovey uh, association with it? Uh, and so um, this tradition actually began, um, or maybe not tradition, maybe just like the, the romantic overtones most likely started um, with the Celtic Druids about 2000 years ago. Um, they noticed that uh, mistletoe would blossom even in the middle of winter. And so it became associated with um, vivacity. So with life and with vitality, with um, reproduction ultimately. <laughs> um, and so uh, again, for thousands of years, this has been associated with um, you know, essentially uh, re restoration of fertility, um, again, because it flowers all year round. Um, there's also a Nordic myth um, having to do with Loki. Um, Loki, uh, you know, got into some trouble with uh, Frigga's son, um, and Frigga ultimately was able to uh, revive her son under the mistletoe, and um, she ultimately said that um, anyone that stands under the mistletoe should not only be, you know, have life, but also um, get a kiss as well, because that's what she did for her son. Uh, and so uh, long-standing traditions uh, behind mistletoe. Okay. Um, not only is mistletoe a parasite um, that just happens to have this positive association with it, um, but also um, it is pretty harmful. Um, it's very poisonous, although um, some organisms can benefit like birds. It can be, um, it, it can provide habitat and structure, um, but uh, there are many toxins similar to cobra venom um, within this plant. Um, so kind of wild mistletoe um, and very much uh, found throughout South Jersey. Okay. Uh, hollow parasites, hollow for whole. So these guys are obligate parasites. Um, again, I'm using plant parasite on plant host examples only here. Um, and so these plants, even though they are plants, they have over time lost their ability to photosynthesize. So in order to actually um, obtain sugar, they need to have an interaction with their host plant. Okay, so um, they not only take a little bit of water and nutrients from the host, they're also taking all of their carbon. And so one example of this um, has a lot of different common names, um, including cancer root and bear cone. Uh, and so it looks like this. Again, it's a plant, so it is dispersed by seeds. Um, deer, bear, other organisms eat this, uh, eat the seeds, eat the plant, um, and then of course, uh, spread the seeds out. Seed grows and um, grows down into the soil um, and ultimately into the roots of different hardwood plants for the most part. And then uh, these uh, kind of flowering bodies emerge when it's time for them to reproduce. Um, and supposedly it has this kind of cabbagey scent. Um, so for the most part, um, this plant is, yes, taking lots of carbon, it's taking water, it's taking nutrients from the host, but for the most part, the plant um, can live a long, healthy life, even if it is infected by this parasite. Um, however, if there are other stressors that the plant is experiencing, so if there is a drought or if there is um, you know, an aphid infestation or something, um, then the demands of the parasite can become too much for the tree and it can ultimately kill the tree. Okay. Um, this plant, this parasitic plant has been uh, very useful, uh, particularly to um, Native Americans of North America. Um, it has been medis uh, medicinal because it has many estrogenic properties. Uh, so it's been used to treat menopause, it's been used to treat uh, menstrual cramps, um, bleeding, not only menstrual bleeding, but also um, like ulcers and stuff, um, and even headaches. And so very uh, widely used um, by Native Americans. Parasites can be classified by size. They can be classified by um, whether or not they need 
their host, right? So facultative or obligate. Um, and also they can be classified by the host habitat. Essentially, do they live on the outside of the host or do they have to live on the inside of the host? Um, ectoparasites are your classic um, on the surface parasites. So think ticks and lice and fleas, like those types of things are absolutely taking advantage of your resources. You are being hurt by these parasites, but of course, these parasites are not internal. Okay, so ectoparasites like these guys. Um, endoparasites, on the other hand, must live within the organism itself. So they burrow under the skin, they are transported throughout the blood, they infect your tissues from the inside. And so they are able to infect a host um, via an orifice. And so this is uh, very common, right? So if you, um, you know, don't wash your hands before you eat and you put your hands into your mouth or you touch your food with your dirty hands and put it into your mouth. Um, that is a very common means of infection by endoparasites. Um, also, um, in many cases, um, they can cross surface barriers. Again, they can burrow under the skin, um, particularly um, associated with ectoparasites. So um, a tick bites your skin, and that is the route of infection for all sorts of lovely tick-borne parasites, <laughs> um, such as the one that causes Lyme disease. I also, um, when you breathe in, um, the air can sometimes have endoparasites, uh, including bacteria, including viruses, and they can cross over this very skinny, very thin barrier between the air and your blood. And so, um, again, endoparasites infect your body by crossing a surface barrier or, um, you know, being ingested um, or otherwise infected via an orifice. Okay. Uh, parasites can be transmitted directly. So the organism itself can go from host to host to host. So um, a lot of endomacroparasites, that is, they live inside, but they are big. Endomacroparasites, um, think of like a tapeworm, um, these can only leave the host um, generally during the larval stage when they are smallest, and the larvae can then be passed to a new host, and they can grow up and make more larvae to infect the next host. And so this is direct transmission um, from host to host. Um, another example, uh, fungus um, in roots can grow onto a nearby root. Um, of course, uh, many Fungal species um, are very beneficial to plants, which of course we talked about um, in the last lesson on mutualism, um, but uh, fungus uh, can be parasitic as well. And so it can infect a nearby plant just by growing in close proximity. Um, parasites may also be transmitted via a vector. So something has to actually transmit between the two hosts in order for infection to occur. Um, so for example, um, if birds carry uh, seeds, um, so uh, you know, in order to uh, spread mistletoe, for example, the bird takes the seed from the mistletoe to a new place, and then the mistletoe can infect a new plant. Okay. Um, another example, uh, spirochetes are carried by ticks. Um, so again, uh, the lovely friend that uh, is responsible for Lyme disease uh, is transmitted by ticks. The ticks do not experience any effects um, of Lyme disease, but they do transmit um, the organism responsible for Lyme disease from one host into the next host, such as a deer or a dog or a human. Um, mosquitoes are uh, very common vectors of parasites, um, of endoparasites. Um, so they are responsible for transmitting over half of the arboviruses, so arthropod-borne viruses. Um, and think of West Nile, think of uh, malaria. The mosquito is acting as the vector. Um, also, insects can be a vector. Um, uh, oh, for sorry, insects can be a vector for uh, plant disease, plant parasites as well. Um, so for example, um, insects carry a plant fungus um, that is responsible for the Dutch elm disease. Um, Dutch elm disease is uh, 
essentially there is no cure. Um, it has spread rapidly throughout North America and killed almost all of the Dutch elm trees um, that were once very abundant um, and now are, um, are almost extinct. Um, essentially, uh, this fungus was transported across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, Dutch elm disease uh, took hold in the east of North America and spread across. Um, there are still Dutch elms um, on the west coast uh, because uh, during that spread, um, a few fungicides were developed uh, to treat this disease, but it is not a perfect process and it is very labor intensive and expensive and um, you know, not many trees were actually saved. And so that's what this image down here in the corner is. This is one of the few remaining Dutch elm trees. Um, and we can see these um, syringes um, injecting the fungicide into the plant. Okay. Um, so a little bit more about vectors, just an example here. Um, this is um, P. Uh, tenuis, uh, so essentially, uh, common name, uh, brain worm or meningeal worm. Um, this has um, a vector to transmit to new hosts. And so this is a deer, this is the intermediate or the vector. Um, so um, we'll start with the first stage um, via defecation. Um, the larval stage or, you know, one of uh, the larvae in the uh, uh, in the natural history um, in the life cycle of this organism is defecated out or is, uh, it leaves its host via feces and uh, slugs and snails encounter the deer feces. They eat it uh, and the infection makes them the intermediate host. So now this first stage larvae is in the snail. Um, a new host, right? A new deer comes along. It is munching on grass, munching on the flowers in your garden bed. Um, and in the process of eating the grass or your flowers, it eats the infected slug. And so um, the slug is taken into the digestive tract. Um, so this orange line here. Um, and during the digestive process, this, um, this larval stage, can infect the lymphatic system, so um, kind of a, a secondary uh, circulatory system, um, which of course distributes the larva throughout the body. Also, um, the larva can directly uh, infect, sorry, um, your central nervous system. And so we have these uh, layers of connective tissue um, surrounding our spinal cord surrounding our brain, they're called meninges. And so this uh, infective stage larva of the brain worm um, infects the covering around your central nervous system here and around the brain. Uh, and so this, uh, uh, this organism then grows up and makes more larvae, um, which can then be passed on uh, to the next host. And so uh, what I want to get at here is that the deer here is the definitive host of this brain worm or meningeal worm. Um, this is where it reaches its adult stage. It's where it's able to reproduce. Um, but in order to be transmitted to the next deer, the larva must infect an intermediate host. And generally, the slug and snail is not um, affected by, uh, by the larva. It is just a vector to go to the next deer. Okay. Uh, and so uh, parasites do have a significant role in population dynamics um, for a lot of reasons, but um, one is that they can alter the behavior of the host. And so I have kind of two fictional examples here, but then I'll show you some real examples here in a moment. Uh, maybe you've seen the episode of Futurama where Fry gets infected by these worms and it completely changes his behavior from being kind of um, aloof and uh, silly to being really intelligent and serious. Uh, and so that is realistic, right? So uh, parasites can completely change the behavior of the host and therefore um, influence how it will interact with other of the same species and other species.
Um, and uh, maybe a more current example here, The Last of Us, so um, a video game and ultimately TV show about uh, a fungus that infects humans, right, uh, based off of a fungus that infects insects. Um, and this fungus um, essentially turns people into zombies. And you can see here kind of the, uh, the progression of the fungal development and, of course, turns people from, you know, in theory, <laughs> intelligent, productive humans into um, hungry zombies. And so, uh, again, this is a, fic a fictional example, and, but uh, I do throw it out there because parasites can substantially impact the behavior of the animal. Okay, um, so real examples here. <laughs> um, when rabbits are infected with a particular um, with a particular parasite, um, again, a tick-borne disease, um, they become really sluggish. And because they're really sluggish, they are more vulnerable to be eaten by predators. And so you can imagine that a sluggish rabbit is going to be eaten. And, um, you know, that is going to impact how many rabbits there are in the population. Um, another example here from your textbook, um, a killifish is a host of another parasite and when it is impact or when it is infected more and more and more, it starts to have kind of weirder and weirder uh, behaviors. Um, so surfacing, so coming close to the surface of the water and therefore um, being vulnerable to being eaten by a shorebird. Okay, uh, jerking, right? So not looking around for predators, just um, kind of fl floundering around in the water um, and becoming very vulnerable. Uh, and so this graph is from your textbook. Here we see the intensity of the infection, so more and more and more of these parasites and these conspicuous behaviors that are going to get the fish eaten. Um, we can see that as the infection increases, the weird vulnerable behavior increases as well. Okay, um, So I ask you, um, why might the increased risk of predation help the parasite, right? Like if you see this, um, this, uh, strategy essentially over and over and over again throughout um, throughout different species, there must be some kind of benefit to it. Uh, and so what might the risk of predation do for the parasite? Like why has um, this parasite evolved to make rabbits sluggish and make killifish a little bit wacky, right? Um, and so uh, to answer this, uh, I want to uh, come back to cordyceps. Uh, so this fungus that um, the last of us is based off of, uh, this fungus infects insects and, uh, essentially it takes over the insect's brain and, uh, makes them crawl up a tree or crawl up to a very tall place and then the animal dies. Uh, and so the timing of this weird behavior, right? Ants on the ground, but all of a sudden they want to climb up a tree. What is that all about? Well, um, the parasite times this weird behavior and subsequent mortality of the insect, the host, um, with when there are enough spores available, right? So when it is able to uh, reproduce, um, animal crawls up really high. We see these little fruiting bodies here. Right, so this is where the spores actually come from. And so um, from way up high in a tree, the spores are going to be able to catch the wind and be blown much farther away than if the animal stayed on the ground. And so it would seem that the parasite is manipulating the host's behavior um, to promote the transmission to new hosts, right? So once the animal um, has been spent right, has been used by the parasite, no longer needs this particular host, it needs the next generation to move on to a new host, so what is the best way for um, that to happen, right, for the rabbit to get eaten, right, for the fish to get eaten, for the spores of the cordyceps to spread far away, right? um, and so similarly, um, if you are a parasite, does it always make sense to kill the host, right? So here, of course, we see that the host is um, has died, right? But do all parasites kill the host? Does it always make sense for the parasites to kill the host? Something to think about. And so uh, this is a lesson on 
interspecific interactions, we have seen how the parasite impacts the host. But as you can imagine, the host doesn't just willingly allow the parasite to take advantage of it, right? And in many cases to kill it. Um, instead, the host um, over many generations, over evolutionary time has developed uh, different ways of kind of fighting back. Right. So how do hosts fight back against their parasites? Well, first and foremost, um, best idea is just to avoid the infection to begin with. And a lot of times this involves um, different types of behaviors. Um, so grooming behaviors uh, removes ectoparasites. Um, it might remove um, endoparasites from the area as well. Um, animals or uh, even other organisms can move to a lower density. Um, and maybe after COVID now we can really appreciate this, um, but social distancing works. Um, you are going to become infected or you're more likely to become infected if you are close by to many other organisms that are infected. Um, if you move out farther away, it is harder for the parasite to get from one host to the next, um, or you can move to a different habitat entirely. Um, so, uh, for, for example, here, um, this is um, a type of roundworm, uh, the life cycle of a roundworm. It lives in humans, humans are the host, and uh, it is uh, released from one host via defecation, right? So in the feces, um, and it can spread to a new host in a couple different ways. Um, the most common way is um, that fecal matter um, gets on the hands of the next host, right? Via this type of scratching here, via um, playing in um, fecal contaminated dirt, via um, not washing vegetables that have been grown using who using human feces, which you know, would not recommend in general, but um, this is how it spread. Uh, so hands dirty with um, traces of fecal matter that are infected by the eggs. Without washing your hands, hands go in your mouth and the egg is then transmitted to the next host, grows up in the larvae, infects the intestines, and ultimately the um, the next generation is passed out again. And so um, host fighting back, right? So first of all, you can avoid infection to begin with. And so this is a lesson in please, oh, please wash your hands. <laughs> if infection occurs, uh, the first strategy, of course, is to isolate the parasite, prevent it from reproducing, prevent it from um, latching onto your tissues or um, penetrating your tissues, um, just isolate it as much as possible. And so there are different strategies for different organisms. Um, the first one I want to talk about is one of our strategies and that is antibodies. Um, so antibodies are these specialized proteins made by our B cells or our B lymphocytes. Um, they have a very, um, very specific shape on the one end of them. So they kind of look like this little Y. Um, they have a specific shape that actually binds to specific parasites. And so here we see um, these little Y-shaped antibodies are binding to the surface of a virus. And this virus now cannot inject its own genetic material into the cells of the host. It is, you know, it's essentially incapacitated. Um, similarly, um, these antibodies can do the same thing with bacteria. Generally, bacteria uh, infect our tissues and they pass from host to host um, essentially um, by being sticky. And so um, if bacteria can't stick to our tissues because these big clunky uh, antibodies in, are in the way, they can't actually infect our cells and um, cause any harm. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so antibodies, we'll come back to the rest of these here in a moment. Um, if you are a plant, uh, you don't produce antibodies, but you do still isolate the parasite as much as possible. Um, and you can actually see where this has happened, right? So where there was an infection starting um, and the plant has isolated the invader. Uh, so things called cysts or galls. Uh, so like this big bump on the side of a tree, right? These bumps here, this is essentially the plant growing its own tissue really quickly 
around the parasite so the parasite can't spread throughout the rest of the plant. Of course, uh, some organisms have kind of hijacked this mechanism and they make like they force the plant to make a gall so that they can live in it. So, you know, lots of crazy strategies on, you know, these guys are co-evolving and we'll get to that in a moment. Okay. So again, um, the host fights back by avoiding infection, right? Usually a behavioral thing. Um, if the infection occurs, it's best to isolate the parasite, prevent it from spreading any farther, reduce the infection. Um, uh, let's see, so another way that humans and other mammals, um, actually another, lots of animals, um, fight an infection is also via the inflammatory response. Um, and so, of course, if you, like, cut your finger, um, like, you'll see that around the cut, it gets really red, it gets really warm. Um, and so essentially, the inflammatory response is bringing lots of blood to that area, which blood happens to have all sorts of um, specialized cells like this macrophage here, macro for big, phage for eater. So these big eaters actually come along and they um, they phagocytose or they like Pac-Man around um, the invading parasite. Um, and once the parasite is inside this macrophage, it is digested with um, enzymes and lysosomes and um, essentially killed. Okay, so as part of the inflammatory response, these specialized cells are brought um, to the scene of the infection. Um, also, as part of the inflammatory response, um, you know, there's a lot of different chemicals that call over, um, you know, additional cells, um, lots of fluid, um, lots of um, kind of chain reactions um, as part of what's called complement. Uh, so this is essentially um, releasing um, really cool molecules that essentially like poke holes in the cells of the pathogen of the parasite here and allow its contents to leak out and essentially it shrivels up and it dies so lysing um the parasite right so inflammation super cool um and this is more of like a you know taking a sledgehammer to uh uh, to the parasite, right? Don't care what it is, but it doesn't look like it belongs here, so we're just gonna like get rid of it with everything we've got. What is more specific and much more powerful is called adaptive immunity. Uh, so this adaptive immunity is much faster um, than this more generic innate response of inflammation, um, much stronger, much more specific. Um, adaptive immunity includes antibodies. It includes cells called cytotoxic T cells, which again, just go around and they like poke holes in specific parasites. Um, it also includes helper T cells, which pretty much ramps up the entire inflammatory response. So essentially we have this arsenal of, um, of weapons specifically to fight back parasites or just fight back, fight away pathogens. Um, Adaptive immunity, um, right? It's faster, it's stronger, it's better overall. Um, the one downside to this, however, is that you're not born with it necessarily. So this has to actually be trained, right? So this is an army that won't just go out and like fight anything that comes along. It only fights specific things. So just a particular virus, just a particular bacteria. Um, and so the first time you are exposed to that parasite, right, so that bacteria, your adaptive immunity is not really involved. It's being trained that, hey, this bacteria is not good. And so the next time you're exposed to it, that army is already there. It's already prepared to fight against this particular parasite. Um, and so it can do so right away and with vigor. Um, Okay, so um, on that note, um, the first time a parasite is introduced to um, a native host population, so um, a population that has never seen um, E. coli before, for example. Um, so this population essentially is defenseless. Its adaptive immune system has never been trained for it, so it's not going to have antibodies, it's not going to have um, different types of T cells that recognize that, hey, this E. coli is not so good. We need to get rid of it right away. And so um, 
the inflammatory response and other types of innate immune defenses are going to be um, a little bit slower and not really as good at eliminating this threat, at isolating it and ultimately eliminating it. And so um, what this does is essentially um, allows the parasite to spread from organism to organism to organism really quickly because nobody has these adaptive defenses against it. Um, and so just a brief aside here about herd immunity, um, what this image is showing us is uh, all of the little blue dots are individuals that have never been exposed to a particular parasite before a particular pathogen. Right? So blue is not exposed, yellow is exposed before. And so the yellow, you can imagine, um, already has a trained adaptive immunity, it already has antibodies, it already has um, different types of T cells that are ready to go the second it is exposed to a particular parasite. Okay. So, um, and I know it says vaccinated here, but um, keep in mind that, uh, well, I'll go back to that. So anyway, the blue dots are individuals in a population that have never been exposed to a particular pathogen or parasite before. Yellow has been exposed, therefore they have adaptive immunity. And so what you can see is um, in the middle when one individual is contaminated, when one individual is exposed to a new parasite, new pathogen, um, the, uh, the parasite can then be spread to a nearby individual and another nearby individual and another nearby individual and so on and so forth. Now, if the population again um, has never been introduced, so in this case up here, nobody has ever been exposed to this parasite before, so there's no defenses. And so if one individual becomes infected, it is really easy for this parasite to spread to everybody nearby and then nearby and nearby and nearby. And so it spreads really quickly, which is what the red lines are showing us. Okay. Of course, um, the more people who, or more people or more, you know, whatever organism we're talking about um, are exposed and therefore have this adaptive immunity, the slower the parasite or um, the illness is spread. Okay, so we can see here that when half of the population has been exposed, it's going to be spread much more slowly than when nobody has been exposed. Um, and finally, when the overwhelming majority of the population has already been exposed and therefore has adaptive immunity, it um, is very difficult for this parasite to spread from one individual to the next because they are so infrequent. Right? It is um, these individuals are not necessarily interacting with each other all the time. They are not in close proximity, and therefore it's difficult um, for transmission to actually occur. Okay, so um, kind of big take home message here is that when a new parasite infects a population, it spreads really, really quickly. It has rapid, devastating effects. And so we have all seen this at this point. Um, when a new virus was introduced to our population, COVID-19, um, it spread really rapidly, right? um, but it slowed down once more and more people were exposed and therefore developed adaptive immunity. And so just a brief aside about that as well, um, there are actually multiple ways of developing this adaptive immunity and therefore sp uh, slowing the tr uh, slowing the transmission. Um, the natural active way, of course, is to be exposed to, in this example, the virus itself. Right? So this way um, you develop antibodies because you've been exposed to the real deal COVID-19, but working in largely the same way um, in the training process anyway, is artificial active immune development. And so this is where the vaccination comes in. This is essentially exposing individuals to just a piece of the parasite. Um, and the adaptive immunity can develop based on the piece, right? So this is beneficial because you're not actually getting the infection itself. You are, um, you know, 
just getting the piece. So you get the benefit of developing the immunity without being infected um, and having all of the disease symptoms as a result. Now, of course, uh, many of us, when we get uh, vaccinated, um, we perhaps have experienced a lot of like really crummy symptoms, right? The fever and the sweats and, you know, all these different things. Um, and so that actually is um, symptoms of your immune system being trained, right? Your immune system is learning that, hey, this is not good. We need to fight this. And so um, like most of those crummy feelings or all of those crummy feelings are merely your immune system. It is not the... Um, the virus itself. In fact, um, whenever you get sick, most of what you're feeling um, is not, you know, the the virus, the bacteria itself. <laughs> Many times, it is mostly symptoms of your own immune system at work. Okay. Um, finally, there are ways of acquiring this uh, adaptive immunity. Um, sorry, adaptive immunity passively. Um, so, for example, you can get antibodies uh, via breastfeeding and across the placental barrier. Um, and if your immune system is so compromised that you cannot train your adaptive immune system, you can't make your own antibodies, you can actually receive antibodies um, from someone else, right? So this is why there's such a huge push, um, you know, to donate or sell plasma. Um, this, uh, you know, removing plasma from one individual um, can be given to another who can't make their own antibodies. Okay, so then these would still be able to isolate the parasite um, and, you know, be involved in this adaptive immune response. Okay. Um, so uh, some examples uh, in addition to COVID-19 um, that have been exposed to populations in North America and have just spread like wildfire because those um, that species was not yet exposed, right? They had no defenses against this parasite. Um, so for example, um, the chestnut blight um, virtually uh, eradicated the American chestnut, which is a type of tree in North America. Um, again, Dutch elm disease, um, it spread across North America, again, just like this like wildfire, um, and it has virtually eliminated elms in North America, um, except for out west. Um, and, of course, we've heard of how smallpox and other Eurasian diseases uh, were brought over by um, European settlers and ultimately killed millions of Native Americans uh, because those Native Americans had not been exposed uh, to these diseases and therefore had no defenses against them. Right? They were not um, exposed. Uh, so outbreaks, such as what we saw um, in, for the first several months of COVID-19. Um, and of course, when um, new variants emerge, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, these outbreaks occur when the host's population density is really high. Um, and thus, you know, social distancing works. Um, and it can sharply reduce the host population. So very high mortality rate when the original host population is very dense. Okay, so what this is showing us here um, is how hosts and parasites have this kind of um, you know, cyclical interaction here, right? So here, uh, when the when the host or sorry, when the parasite first infects a densely populated or dense host population, uh, the parasite population is going to increase, right? It can easily be passed from one to the next to the next. Um, as a result, there's high mortality in the host. And so the host population is going to decrease. As the host population decreases, the parasite population also does, right? Fewer hosts, therefore fewer parasites. As the parasite population decreases, the hosts are able to kind of make a comeback, right? Seems like the problem is solved. We can go back out, um, and do whatever we want to in society again, but then as the host population increases or becomes more dense again, right, reduces that social distancing, comes all together again, um, parasites are then able to increase again, passing from host to host to host, and so on and so forth. So we see um, this pattern fairly commonly. Okay, so uh, if we spread this out, what we can see here, here's time, here's the population. Host population starts out pretty large, a dense host population, parasite can increase because it's passing from host to host to host. 
as the parasite increases, more hosts are dying, and so the host population decreases. With a low host population, the parasite population is going to reduce as well, fewer hosts, and so on and so forth. And so um, co-adaptation uh, is going to be occurring during these um, these processes. And so during an outbreak, um, we have both the host and the parasite evolving to um, make sure that they can still survive, essentially. Um, and so this co-adaptation is due to, um, you know, essentially forms uh, this arms race, right? So co-evolutionary changes um, between these two species, right? So um, we all remember when uh, COVID-19 mutated, um, we had all of these different variants, like, you know, we, the, the population um, was relatively immune, right? Like approaching herd immunity, um, but then a new variant, uh, Right, appeared, right, uh, mutated, and came back, and then, you know, we all were uh, faced with a new variant, and, uh, you know, this part of the curve once again. Um, and so, um, trade-offs, right, what are the trade-offs that are experienced by the parasite and the predator during this, um, this arms race here, right, essentially the parasite, um, if it comes on too strong, and so if it has too high a virulence, um, it comes in, it just wipes out the host population. Um, essentially, the host can be incapacitated or dead. And if you wipe out the entire host population, or you make it so they're not interacting with other hosts anymore, the parasite can no longer pass to a new host before um, the original host has died. Um, on the other hand, if the parasite... Um, has too low a virulence, essentially um, it is not strong enough to fight against the defenses of the host, and therefore it will be eliminated before it has a chance to make more of itself, right? So the parasite has to kind of find this like happy medium in between too strong and not strong enough. Um, both result in reduced transmission. Um, the host also um, has to, you know, deal with some trade-offs here. Um, Yes, of course, uh, it is in the host's best interest to eliminate the parasite, but doing so is really expensive, essentially. Um, so when fighting parasites, uh, it is, you know, you feel so tired, you feel so drained. Um, and of course, you know, you have a fever and you're sweating and all these, like aches and pains and everything. Um, so it is really costly to the host to get rid of the parasite. And so in some cases, parasitic relationships can evolve into commensalism or even into mutualism. Um, so uh, sometimes the, uh, the costs of fighting are too great. And so eventually these organisms develop um, a relationship in which both are benefiting. And so for example, um, Spanish moss, so here we see a tree in the uh, so southeastern North America, um, and all of this like green fluffy stuff here, this is called Spanish moss. Um, so it may have begun as a hemiparasite, but over time it became commensal. Um, another example, uh, the microbiome, right? So generally um, we think of you know, bacteria infecting our bodies as being a really bad thing. And so our immune system needs to fight it off and get rid of that uh, parasite, that um, that endoparasite, right? However, uh, we of course have evolved to really benefit from certain species. Um, and so maybe they started out as um, a parasite, but over time, um, you know, in this arms race, both the bacterial species and human species evolved to work together instead. So one example um, is lactobacillus. Um, you might recognize this particular um, name, this particular genus name, because this is in a lot of prebiotics. So essentially we purposely invite these bacteria into our bodies. Um, of course, we give them carbohydrates, we give them fiber, um, 
And so in that context, they would seem like a parasite. However, they give us so many lovely things in return. Um, one example of this is they fight off. So they, um, they offer our body defense against other parasites. So uh, one parasite, for example, Candida albicans is, um, is a fungus like the yeast infection fungus. And so lactobacillus, in exchange for food and shelter from us, it fights off this uh, yeast infection fungus. Um, and so of course, now we both benefit. Uh, and so maybe uh, other uh, mutualisms developed in the same way, started out as a parasitic relationship, evolved into a mutualistic relationship. Predation. This is an example, um, another example of when one organism benefits and the other loses. So a clear winner and a clear loser. Um, so we can think of carnivores and omnivores as consuming one living organism. Um, a true predator um, kills and immediately eats uh, its prey. Right? As opposed to scavengers and decomposers, yes, they are absolutely eating um, other organisms, right? We're always eating other organisms, but, um, you know, again, a true predator only eats the prey right after it is killed. Okay. Um, and so I want to introduce um, C. Uh, this represents the capture efficiency by the predator. So essentially, the higher the C, the more efficient the predator is. So um, high C equals more prey is consumed by each predator. And so once again, we can uh, modify our uh, population growth equation here, right? So population growth rate per capita growth rate times the number in the population. And so um, we can use modifications of this to model prey populations as well as predator populations. Okay, so again, C is the capture efficiency by the predator. Um, and so um, this new, uh, you know, this new part of the equation here is essentially representing the deaths due to predators. So here we can see the capture efficiency um, times the number of prey times the number of predators. So essentially, um, we can see here that the number of predators and the number of prey are going to determine, um, you know, how many prey are able to survive, essentially. More predators means fewer prey are going to survive. Um, and similarly, we can modify the same equation um, if we kind of expand out this per capita growth rate here to births minus deaths. We can get this equation here, right? So births minus deaths. Um, and um, the births as a result of available prey and the efficiency of the hunter is calculated in this way. Uh, and so these equations um, and some others that I'm going to show you here um, are used in what is called the Latka Volterra model of predator prey dynamics. Okay. Um, and so in general, um, we can imagine that as there are more prey, the predators are going to increase, right? So when there's a lot for the predators to eat, right? So lots for the predators to eat, lots for prey, the predator population can increase, okay? However, as there are more and more predators, each individual predator is eating a certain number of prey, and so the number of prey starts to decrease. Okay. So as predators increase, the prey are going to decrease. Um, as the prey decrease enough, right? so prey population has just been decimated, now there's not really much for the predators to eat. And so now the predator population is also going to reduce. Okay. Without so much pressure from the predators, the prey population is able to bounce back. So we see the prey population starts to increase again. And so we see again this um, same pattern where the prey population peaks right before the predator population peaks. 
Okay. Um, and so if we map this pattern out um, in terms of number of prey, so no prey versus lots of prey, and predators on the y-axis, no predators versus lots of predators, we get something that looks like this. Okay, so let me walk you through this again. Um, these numbers are corresponding to these numbers. So here, what we see is when there are a lot of prey, okay, so number one, lots of prey, the predator population is going to increase. Okay, so this green is showing us increasing prey, red is showing us increasing predators, right? So that represents this right here. As the predators increase, so here, the prey population is going to decrease, right? So that's what's going on up here. Um, so number of predators has increased to being really high. And as a result of the prey population is going to start declining. So back down in this direction. So that is this quadrant, okay? Um, in the third quadrant here, we see that um, the predator population starts to decline because the prey population is just, you know, absolutely decimated, okay? So in this quadrant, we see that the prey population still keeps going down, but now the predator population is going to start going down as well, okay? Finally, as there are little to no predators, right, the, Oh, sorry. Uh, so um, predator population is declining. And so the prey population gets to um, increase again with the uh, lessened uh, predation pressure. And so once again, we can see an increase in the prey and a decrease in the predators. And so this cycle, um, if you were to map it out year after year or you know cycle after cycle, it essentially forms this whole circle here, right? So we're actually going to see that um, in a class assignment that you guys are going to do. Okay, so it goes around and around and around, cycle, cycle, cycle. Okay, um, so this is the Lotka-Volterra model of predator-prey dynamics, and so dynamics meaning um, the changing populations over time. Okay, um, and so we can um, describe a uh, these predator prey interactions um, that are resulting in these population cycles. Um, so uh, the growth rate of the prey population is zero, right? So one of the things that we can talk about, um, so prey population is not growing, it's not declining, like right in the middle here, when the number of predators is equal to the number or the growth rate of the prey over the uh, capture efficiency of the predators. Right, so this number right here, um, so R over C, um, this is when the uh, graph, right, so the, the cycle, the prey, stops growing and starts declining. So this point right here is represented by this green line, and we can call it the zero growth isocline for the prey population. Again, below the line, population is growing, above the line, it is declining. And so um, if you, so expected equilibrium population sizes um, of the one species, if the abundance of the second species is held constant. So essentially, if you maintain, um, you know, the number of lions to this particular number, right, that will essentially keep the prey population, or whatever the wildebeest population, um, constant. Again, if you hold this constant here, okay. Um, the growth rate of the predator population is zero when this, right? So the mortality of the predators over the birth of the predators times the um, the capture efficiency. Right? So this will give us the number of prey to keep the predator population constant. Okay. Um, again, this is a zero growth isocline for the predator population. So this calculation, this line right here, the number of prey to keep the predator population the same. Okay, so at equilibrium. Okay. Um, and so classic example of these cycles, um, the lynx hair cycle. So in the 1800s, early 1900s, um, 
hunters would come in uh, to document how many lynx, right? so how many of this wild cat were captured, and how many snowshoe hares, right? these bunnies, were captured right, during hunting. Um, and so over time, when this data was graphed, um, what was noticed was essentially this you know, peak in the prey population, followed by a peak in the predator population, and so on and so forth. Um, and so always we see the peak in the prey before the predator. Okay? And so once again, if we graph this out um, differently, so the number of hairs versus the number of links, and each one of these dots represents a year, right? so 87, 88, 89, et cetera, um, what we see is that we start out with, oh, here, we'll go over here. Um, here we have lots of links, lots of hairs, right? So lots of links are going to eat lots of hairs. And so the hair population is going to decrease. It's gone this way, right? As the hair population decreases, the links population has to decrease, right? And so on and so forth. It goes around and around and around, just like we saw on the previous slide um, for the Laco Volterra model. Um, a few experiments to kind of drive this point home. These experiments are classic in the field of ecology. Um, two protospecies, one prey, one predator, um, in the first experiment were, great, were raised together, um, just in a growth medium, right? No, uh, no shelter, no nothing, just like the two species. And so what we see is that at first the prey did really well, but as soon as the predator was, in, was um, added to the environment, predators had a lot to eat, prey population was completely wiped out, right? And so then with nothing to eat, the predator population went down, okay? Um, in the next experiment, Gauss added a refuge for prey to hide in. So somewhere for the prey to, um, to hide and they were really good at hiding. And so what they found was that um, the predators were able to find some of maybe, um, you know, the, the less intelligent or less lucky prey at first, but then, um, you know, the prey, you know, were able, to, the, the remaining prey were able to survive, predators couldn't find the prey, and so their population uh, was wiped out as well. Okay, um, in order to mimic the natural lynx hair cycle and the normal lack of Volterra model, um, one new predator and prey were introduced every third day. And so this is essentially representing births and deaths, or sorry, it's representing births. Um, so here we have, um, you know, a certain number of prey are added, new predators are added at the same time. Prey population peaks before the predator population. There's still refuge for the prey to hide in. And so again, we see this very nice um, peak of the prey immediately preceding the, uh, the peak for the predator population. Um, another classic experiment by Carl Huppiger. Um, in the first trial of this experiment, um, they used a single habitat, a single orange that was infested by prey. Okay, so the prey is uh, this guy right here. Um, immediately, uh, because there was just a single orange, there wasn't like anywhere for the prey to hide, the predator ate all of the prey and then immediately died of starvation. Um, so again, not very realistic for what is going on in the, uh, in the wild. And so in the second experiment, which is what this graph is showing us here, um, not only one orange was added, but many oranges, lots of barriers, lots of places for the prey to hide. And so with this more realistic environment, once again, we see the prey population spikes right before the predator population spikes and so on and so forth. Okay, um, and so this model, this log of Volterra model can predict the predator prey oscillations, but only in what is called a heterogeneous environment, only in an environment with uh, places for the organisms to hide away from uh, the predators. And so um, this lock of Volterra model assumes that there is a mutual regulation of predator and prey populations. That is, the predators 
regulate the prey from the top, so top down, and the prey regulate the predators from the bottom up. So it is going in both directions, um, and that is what is needed uh, for this model to actually work. Okay, uh, and so the regulation of the predator population, I've right, already talked about how um, the predators regulate the prey, but also the prey affects the predators. Okay, so the regulation of these predators depends on um, a couple different things. First of all, the per capita rate at which prey are captured. So how good is this shark at capturing its prey? It's really good or is it not? Essentially, if the efficiency, if the rate of capture of this guy is really high, essentially he's going to eat a lot more. Okay. Uh, so on um, this relationship between the per capita rate of consumption and the number of prey is referred to as this functional response, so this efficiency here. Okay. Um, and so essentially, depending on the species, there are actually three different types um, of functional response. All right, so um, again, efficiency at which the predator can actually capture the prey. And again, that depends on the species, the strategy of the animal. Um, the second uh, factor that is um, determining predator populations is what is called the numerical response. And so essentially this is um, the increased reproduction or immigration, so more animals coming in um, that results from more food being available. Okay. Um, so essentially if there are more prey, this is going to um, allow animals to reproduce more, therefore making more predators. Um, and if there's a lot of food here, other animals where there isn't a lot of food is going to come and start, um, you know, increase the predation in the area with lots of prey. Okay, so aggregation. All right, so let's take a look at the three types of functional response as well as the numerical response. And the type one functional response is shown here in orange. Um, and this is the baseline that's assumed for the lockable Terra equations. Um, essentially, the more prey that there is available, so increasing prey, means that there's going to be more prey captured per unit of time. So the number of prey consumed per predator per unit time. So more prey available equals everybody's going to eat more. Okay, And so this is really common, uh, or this is the strategy, um, the type 1 functional response for passive predators like filter feeders. Filter feeders. So here we can see this baleen whale. He's going to swim around, and um, if there are, if there's a lot of prey in the water, right, he's going to get a lot to eat. If there's not a lot of prey in the water, he's not going to get a lot to eat. And so this would follow this very um, linear growth here. Okay. Um, this uh, type one functional response and subsequently the lock of Volterra model doesn't completely uh, accurately reflect the wild condition. Uh, so uh, essentially um, it does not uh, factor in two, or sorry, uh, this functional response is limited by two assumptions. So two pretty unrealistic assumptions. Um, and the first is that the animal is never full, right? So essentially if this baleen whale gets full, he's gonna stop swimming around and eating, right? So that is not factored in here. Um, here we can see a marine copepod, which is called Calanus. Um, it's a filter feeder, a little zooplankton, um, and it eats full cells in the water. And so at first, right, the more cells there are, the more this copepod eats. However, at a certain point, it gets full, right? Um, and this uh, slope is going to flatten out. Okay, so type one is this part, but in reality, there's also there's actually a plateau. Okay, um, the second uh, assumption here is that um, again unrealistic assumption is that there is no handling time of the prey that it physically does not take time to capture the prey. Um, but in reality, we know that it takes time to find the prey, to capture it, to consume the prey, and so that is also giving rise to this plateau. The type 2 functional response considers that first assumption, that handling, or sorry, the, the second 
um, assumption, this uh, concept of handling time. Um, so T represents the total amount of time a predator spends feeding. Um, so this is composed of um, how much time the predator is searching for the prey or chasing the prey or otherwise acquiring the prey. Okay. Um, so uh, it's also going to factor in the time spent um, handling the prey once it's found. Right? So how much time does it actually take to eat the prey? So if a lion is uh, chasing, chasing, chasing the gazelle, that is T sub S, the time spent searching for the prey. Um, and the handling time is the time it takes for um, the lion to actually consume the gazelle, okay, to actually eat it. Uh, and so this curve, the type two curve, we see um, as prey increases, right? so too does the number of prey consumed. So if there are a thousand gazelle, um, the predator is going to eat a lot more than if there were 10 gazelle. However, uh, because it takes so much time to handle the prey, right, to actually eat the gazelle, we see the slope um, kind of level out. Um, generally, um, this type 2 functional response is seen in true predators, so animals that are hunting actively and um, and consuming their dead prey right away. Right? So here, the lynx hair again, um, as the prey population increases, so more and more and more snowshoe hares, we see that at first the lynx is able to get lots and lots and lots. Right, so very much increasing how much you can eat because the prey population is increasing, there's more available. But because of the time spent searching and the time spent actually eating, again, type 2 functional response, you see this plateau, right? This curve as opposed to kind of hitting a wall. Type 3 functional response this is the rate at which. Uh, Prey are consumed is lower at first, and then it resembles type two. So here we see um, kind of a slow start, even though the, um, the prey population is increasing, but then we have a rapid increase in how many prey are consumed before leveling out because of time. Okay. Um, so this is um, a functional response that is reflect affected by refuge availability. Right, so when there is a relatively small population size, all of the prey can hide. But as the prey gets large enough, or prey population gets large enough, not everyone can hide. Now you see lots and lots more prey out in the open, therefore vulnerable, and of course, a rapid increase in how many prey are consumed. Um, this is also affected by predator search image. So maybe um a new species is introduced to the environment. Um, the lynx doesn't know this new species of rabbit, and so it doesn't know that, hey, this is really tasty. And so um, at first, it doesn't really go after the new species of rabbit. But as soon as it realizes that, hey, like this species is also pretty tasty, it is going to, um, again, rapidly increase its uh, prey consumption. Um, and prey switching. Um, a predator might uh, prefer a certain prey, but, um, right, so it might prefer a particular prey species, but if another prey species is abundant enough, maybe it is going to switch to that one just because it's a little bit easier. Um, so this graph from your textbook, we can see um, this charming little fish here. Um, well, so your uh, proportion available versus proportion eaten. So the same, um, you know, prey versus um, percent of prey that are actually eaten. Um, the straight line here is the expected rate of predation, assuming no preference. So whatever is eating your little fish, um, they can, uh, they eat everybody the same, right? No preference. But uh, what you see in type three functional response is that the predator doesn't really think it's worth it to go after these little guys when there are so few of them. But when the population is large, okay, it's worth actually going after these little fish now. And so you see that the percentage of prey that is 
that are consumed by the predator is going to increase rapidly as well. All right, so again, type one, this is like filter feeders, right? If there's more prey, they're gonna be eaten, um, you know, linearly. Uh, type two, this is uh, generally true predators, right? So true predators might, um, you know, increase, increase, increase their consumption rate um, as the prey, or sorry, as the prey population increases, but because it takes so long to actually catch and eat the prey, you see, um, you see a plateau. Um, and then finally, type three, predator doesn't really want this particular prey species at first, but if there's enough of them, okay, it's worth its time. Um, next, the numerical response. Remember that this is when, um, you know, as the prey population increases, this is going to both increase how many new babies are born and therefore um, how many prey they're going to eat. Um, and it is going to encourage others to come into the area. Okay. So numerical response, right? this bottom-up effect, prey population influencing predator population, um, leads to an increased reproduction by predators. Okay. Um, so in this graph here, we see um, as prey populations increase, so too do the predator populations right? due to birth. Um, also, we have immigration. Um, and so I put this here um, because, uh, of course, in the summertime, you go to the boardwalk and everybody has their buckets of fries and they have like all sorts of food and everything. And so this is going to attract gulls from the surrounding areas. And like, frankly, gulls um, are not just scavengers. Like they will hunt, they will eat like any other shorebird. And so like, you know, not offensive at all. But then of course, huge source of prey comes down from New York and it comes down from Philly in the summertime. And now all of this prey, um, French fries, is available. And so the gulls in the marsh are going to immigrate to the boardwalk and of course very much increase the population size, right? So in this way, the prey, the French fries, um, has a bottom-up effect on the predator population right? because it's attracting them in. Um, another, uh, another example here, uh, cattle egrets. So these guys here, um, yes, they they're shorebirds as well, but they, uh, follow, um, they follow cattle. So, you know, migrating buffalo herds, they also, um, live around, um, cattle farms. And so these guys love to eat insects that happen to be in, uh, cattle feces. And so, um, these birds will migrate towards the cattle because that is where the most food, the most insects in the feces are actually located. Okay. And of course, there is a bit of, um, you know, these guys hang around them so much, there's plenty to eat, and so they're going to have more babies. Okay. So again, um, the numerical response and the uh, functional response, both of these are examples of prey impacting predator populations. Um, one is hunting efficiency, the other is um, breeding and immigration. Okay. Optimal foraging theory. Um, so this is a concept um, in which, um, in addition to foraging, predators have to allocate time um, to do other things, right? To avoid their own predators, to defend themselves, to defend their um, their nest or defend their territory against others in the same species, um, to look for mates, to actually mate, to care for the young, to feed the young, etc. Um, so foraging, eating, isn't the only thing that is on the mind of these animals. So there is this balance, right? There's always a trade-off between eating and these other things. Okay. So meeting all these demands requires trade-offs. And so um, optimal foraging theory um, states that natural selection fa favors more efficient foragers. So um, individuals that maximize their nutrient intake per unit of effort, right? So it's better to eat um, uh, something that's packed with calories once a day. So the rest of the day can be spent, you know, trying to find a mate as opposed to 
needing to hunt all day long because all of your food has very little nutrient uh, nutritive value. Okay. Um, and so um, subconsciously, animals are using this cost benefit approach. Right, so the cost is the time and energy that they need to forage, uh, but the benefit is how much um, their fitness is increased, so how much their reproduction is increased, um, measured in terms of energy or nutrient gain. Um, and of course, again, this is correlated to fitness. Um, and so we can use this um, framework of time allocation that we looked at before in the um, on a previous slide. So the total time um, that you're spending in so this cost um, includes the time searching and the time handling. All right. So um, in general, smaller hay, oh, sorry, smaller prey uh, may be a little bit easy to handle. Right. So it may be easy to find them, but um, the benefit is not that great. Right. So you're reducing your cost, but also the benefit is being reduced as well. Um, large prey, on the other hand, this is generally harder to handle. Um, it might be harder, um, you know, for uh, a fox to take down a deer, but if it does take down a deer, which is really big, it's going to have a lot to eat, and so a huge payoff. Okay. Uh, and so this graph right here is uh, representing optimal foraging theory. Um, here is prey length or prey size, and um, how many uh, of these prey items are available size. And so the availability, what we see here, is um, essentially that most of the prey is about eight millimeters long, right? So mostly available here. Um, however, this bird is going to actively select prey that is a little bit smaller. So most of the prey that's selected is smaller than the average. And so what that means to us is that, or should indicate to us, is that um, subconsciously this bird has learned that um, you know it's easier to get the smaller prey right because you know there's enough available um, it is able to meet its energy needs right with the smaller prey right so an example here um, so we can think through this um, orcas of Antarctica uh, these are um, these guys eat seals, right? A couple different types of seals. They're not specialists. They can eat you know, kind of whatever. Um, and so there are two different seal species that, um, you know, the whales favor. Um, there are crab eater eels, right? Which are everywhere, right? So lots and lots of crab eater ale, seals. On the other hand, there's um, Weddell seals. So these seals are um, fairly rare. Um, what we see in these orcas is that um, the you know, up to seven of these animals will actually work together to charge a Weddell seal, so less abundant, rare seal, and work together to essentially make sure that it stays in the water and unfortunately drowns. Um, and so in this way, um, you know, the whales are putting in a ton of effort, right, a ton of time in searching, um, searching for the seal, capturing the seal, so that they can all share right, this one animal. Um, and so what is going on there, right? Given optimal foraging theory, what must be the difference between these two seals, right? These guys are everywhere, right? Maybe easy for one whale to take down and to eat, but instead what you see is that more whales are spending a lot of time and they're sharing this rare seal. So what is going on? Um, so given optimal foraging theory, um, the difference must be that it is worth it to go after this rare seal. There must be a um, you know, lot of bang for your buck, um, lots of nutrients, lots of energy from this one seal, more so than if they would spend less time, less energy going after these more abundant seals. Um, so, uh, just like we talked about with um, parasites and their hosts, 
the prey also fight back against their predators. Um, most predators, in fact, are prey for other species. Um, and all prey essentially are at risk of being predated upon while carrying out their routine activities, so while foraging. Right, so um, another reason why you, know, you might want to reduce the time that you're foraging is you don't want to get eaten while you're distracted trying to find the perfect prey. Uh, predator defenses, um, this is the term for any characteristic that helps a prey avoid detection or capture um, by a predator, and therefore it's helping the prey itself. Um, and again, just like with parasites, this is kind of an arms race, a co-evolutionary race. Um, the predator and prey are evolving new strategies, evolving new adaptations, um, which is going to maintain their relationship in the long term. And so um, I ask you to think about what ways a uh, predator or prey might fight back against their predators. What types of defenses are there? How can prey survive even though they are constantly being hunted? Uh, and so here are some examples. Um, so there are chemical defenses, right? So maybe the prey tastes bad, right? Or uh, has some kind of poison within it, right? Um, cryptic coloration, so maybe it can um, camouflage into the surrounding environment. Uh, maybe it looks like something else, right? So something that is not very palatable, right? like a stick bug. Um, flashing coloration, so like, um, you know, confusing the predator, um, warning them maybe that um, they don't taste good or warning them that they are poisonous, um, maybe mimicking another animal that is poisonous, um, having protective armor, right? So like a turtle doesn't have, you know, a lot of other defensive strategies, but it is really hard. And so it's difficult for predators to actually eat it. Um, and of course, changing your behavior. Um, and so one last question here, um, what about plants? Like we've been talking about uh, predator or sorry, uh, animals fighting back against the predators, but plants are also eaten by herbivores. So herbivore, more or less predators. Um, can plants fight back against the herbivore predator? Um, and as you might imagine, yes, they can. They have evolved all sorts of fun ways of doing so, um, some of which are uh, you know, unpleasant or even fatal. So things like thorns, things like um, poisons that will kill the predator, um, and others have evolved to maybe disorient the predator. Uh, so things like THC, things like um, opium, right, have evolved in plants to dis uh, distort the reality of the predator, therefore making him confused and kind of wander off and not eat the plant up. Uh, so with that, I'm going to end this lesson. Thank you guys so much for watching and look forward to the next time.